This is a story of a life filled with the promise of hope, love, family, and future. A life changed irrevocably on July 1st, 1944, when that family and future were forever altered in a place known as Beer Canal. This is a record of journeys back to that place of cataclysmic change, a chance to witness and understand the need to repeatedly return to that place of death, a place designed to take away life and all sense of identity. Why are you coming back? so many times because I feel the need to meet them over and over again and give my love and remembering them right in this place in the Castle Park. They help me. Mm. They help me. They give me strength. May 26th, 2006. Joining Noemi are 36 Washington State teachers, students, their families, and friends. Their goal is to visit Beer Canal with Noemi and see the camp through her eyes. Noemi Bonn was born Schoenberger Noemi September 29th, 1922 in Seged, Hungary, to Yulishka, or Julia, and Shamu Schoenberger. Yulishka, born October 3rd, 1900, was the second daughter of Nina Volberg Schoenberger of Tokai and Moritz Schoenberger. Siblings Bela, Shandor, Erzibet, or Bergi, and Yoshef were second cousins to Shamu, born April 29th, 1896, the third son of Zygmunt Schoenberger. Falling deeply and quietly in love with each other, Yulishka and Shamu were separated by Hungary's entry into World War I. Shamu was captured by the Soviets and spent the remainder of the war in a gulag in Siberia. It was here that he wrote, Do you know, you the beauty of my world, do you feel it? You the most beautiful on this earth, I will always wait for you. Where is the end of my sorrow? On the wings of my yearning I fly toward you, but to arrive, to get to you, I have not the strength anymore. Maybe you have forgotten me. Why and for how long? Without you, why would I want to live? When the war ended, Shamu returned to Seged, where he and Yulishka were married in December of 1921. Amy, as Noemi was called by her father, arrived nine months later. Noemi's first three years were spent in Seged, where Shamu taught at the local synagogue. The family then moved to Estergom, where Shamu taught at a public school. Noemi befriended Ergi Dohanyi, the local rabbi's daughter, whereupon meeting each other for the first time, they mutually decided to fill their pants with sand, thus cementing a friendship that lasted a lifetime. Ergebet, or Ergi, was born August 2nd, 1931. Though nine years apart, the two sisters were inseparable. Family was important to the Schoenbergers. Their house was filled with good Hungarian food, literature, music with Noemi on piano and Shamu on violin, and discussions around the family table. Noemi was, of course, the one who could always make her mother laugh. Lake Bolton was an annual summer outing where the Schoenbergers were often joined by other teachers and their families. To keep the adults from talking shop about teaching, Noemi devised a fine. Every time teaching became part of the discussion, money was put into an ice cream fund. Needless to say, the children never lacked for ice cream. <laughs> Bis zum letzten Hauch dieses Deutschland, der deutsche Volksgemeinschaft aller deutschen Stämme. With Hitler's rise to power in 1933, Shamu, shocked, confused, and horrified, said to Noemi, This man is dangerous. Not only what he said, but how he said it. 
I am afraid what will come after this. It was Noemi's intention to become a teacher, but with the events of Kristallnacht and the news out of Poland, a very frightened Yulishka decided it would be better if Noemi had a trade. As the family prepared to move to Debrecen, where Shamu would become the principal of a much larger school, Noemi sadly moved to Budapest to learn to sew. About this time, Noemi was introduced to Erno Blyer, a 28-year-old teacher. His was love at first sight. Noemi, on the other hand, thought he was a nice man, but too old. In the spring of 1943, Yulishka became pregnant with a third child. It was not an easy pregnancy. Yulishka was bedridden, and Noemi was called home to Debertson to help. Though a difficult birth, Gabor Schoenberger was born December 25, 1943. At his bris, the rabbi said, Life changed for the Schoenberger family and all of Hungary on March 19, 1944, when Germany entered Hungary. On that day, a very scared 13-year-old Erzsébet hurried home from school. I'm afraid. Who are these people? All of them are soldiers. Why are they here? Every street is full of them. Who are they? Restrictions followed quickly. The first having to wear the yellow star of David on their clothing for identification. One day men came and took away the family piano. Noemi cried, feeling like someone had died. In April, Shamu was conscripted to a forced labor camp. Separated for the first time after 25 years of marriage, Yulishka felt, I have a terrible feeling I won't see him ever again. Those words were sadly prophetic. The small Schoenberger home became part of the borderline of the ghetto. Eight families were brought in to live with the Schoenbergers in their tiny home. On June 14th, all families at Sechini Utsa 51 were lined up in the backyard. They were all then marched to a brick factory where they spent the next 10 days waiting, wondering what will happen next. On the 11th day, they were all loaded into cattle cars, 85 people per car. With no idea where the train was going, Noemi and her family spent the next eight days in transit. Erzsébet, never far from older sister Noemi, held tightly onto her hand and without speaking, looked into Noemi's eyes for answers. That answer came July the 1st when the train passed through the Polish town of Auschwitz and then finally through the gates of Auschwitz II, Birkenau. Built on the site of a former Polish army barrack, Auschwitz II Beer Canal is immense, the size of 500 football fields. Five gas chambers were designed to help facilitate the death and disposal of the many hundreds of bodies. Death was provided by Zyklon B gas pellets. Disposal of the bodies was in the adjoining crematoriums. In the summer of 1944, the facility was full beyond measure, separated immediately by Joseph Mengele, Noemi's dear ones, Nina, Yulishka, Erzsébet, and baby Gabor were sent to their untimely deaths in gas chamber number five. The last communication Noemi had with her mother was an unspoken look that passed between them. Take care, Noemi. I love you. Noemi was shaved and showered and assigned to barrack number 24 in section B2C. It was here Noemi would spend the next four months living on bread made of sawdust, soup designed to stop her menstruation, and no water. Severely dehydrated and thin from lack of food, Noemi was among a thousand other Hungarian Jewesses chosen by Joseph Mengele to be transferred to Munchmula, a subcamp of Buchenwald located near the German city of Stadt Allendorf. The young women were loaded again into cattle cars and sent west. For the first ten days, they did nothing. They were fed and prepared for the new jobs, to make bombs for the Third Reich. Walking from the camp to the bomb factory every day through rain and snow, the young women took it upon themselves to do something and decided to sabotage the bombs. In the spring of 1945, with Patton's army approaching, Munchmüller was evacuated in a forced death march to Bergen-Belsen. 
And so it was on this crisp day in April that Noemi and twelve of her friends stepped out of that forced death march and escaped into the forest. To be found by an American soldier who informed them that they were all free. The soldier then took them all back to his camp, where they were carefully nursed back to health. It wasn't until September of that year that Noemi finally found her way back to Budapest. Arriving at New Gatti Station, Noemi walked many blocks to find the school where she knew her uncle had been teaching before the war. It was there that she learned that her father Shamu had survived. Shamu had heard rumors that the family was seen alive in Germany. Noemi, knowing the truth, knew she had to be the one to tell her father of their dear one's annihilation. Grief-stricken, Shamu would change his family name to Gabor in honor of his precious only son. Erno Blyer, the teacher, had also been sent to a forced labor camp. Surviving, he had returned to Seged, where he changed his name to Bon. Upon learning that Noemi had survived, he traveled immediately to Debertson and proposed, and said to Shamu, I'm not leaving this house until Noemi agrees to marry me. To Noemi, he didn't look so old anymore. Noemi and Ernest were married October 25th, 1945. First son Stephen was born in Seged, and then a teaching job took the family to Budapest, where George was born two years later. In the meantime, This is the last trip I'm taking to, to Auschwitz, who are with me, three wonderful friends. I just had, I just had a, a good sandwich and all. Is it not a victory that I'm able to do that? Very important, but the most victorious part is that I notice it. Hey, Noemi, what are you talking about? Soft cover. One is buying for me a sandwich, two bottles of water. I am getting the most comfortable place to be of the cold who pay it. And, 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 and five minutes ago, where was I? I was in Auschwitz with one drag on me. 80, 100 people in one room on the dirt floor. No bathroom in the barrack. You have to go out to the latrine. And while you are on that latrine in the morning, for example, no matter how far are you, if you don't get up and stand in line, then they pull you up by your ear and kick you in the throat. That's what I was five minutes ago. And look, look what I'm complaining about. And that is so wonderful that I know that. And I feel that how victorious I am, that I'm alive. As you say that you're teaching your students, they love themselves to take care of themselves. I try to tell the people that learn Life is give you a lot of good things. There are difficulties, there is a way. But realize how precious it is and how important life is and love it. 
and that's why I can do it. When we are teaching all these things, we are learning every single time. Isn't it true? We're learning about ourselves and we're learning about what else to do is a push. If you achieve that much, go further. Do you think Remy Bond is stubborn? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when they say, oh, how, are, how are you able to go there? It is too painful. This goes into the line that we have to teach grown-ups, children, middle-aged, middle class, middle school, that to feel pain is not the worst thing in the world. Pain is something is available to give in your feeling and do something about it. Don't be afraid of your feelings. They are there. They are yours. If you are away from your pain, you also, most of the time, you are afraid, afraid of love. They are feelings. You have them, deal with them. It was the very, very last time I saw them, never again. Did this talking about my experience and losing all the dear ones of mine, it's a kind of memorial for them, that I am trying to do something good out of this terrible tragedy. Noemi not only has an incredible story to tell, but she tells it in an incredible way. Having been a teacher herself her entire life, she's able to make that connection right away with students and bring the history of it, the human quality of it, and the dignity of her story home very quickly. Please don't take your freedom for granted. I live under two dictatorships. I know what freedom means. And one advice I would like to give you before I close, if you have problems and find someone you can talk to, share it. It makes it easier. Look at me. <laughs> to teach the lessons of the Holocaust became my mission. It gave me the chance that to turn some way the terror, the horror, the trauma I experienced into a very meaningful activity. Visiting schools, teaching young people about the lessons of the Holocaust. To be one of the Golden Apple Award winners fills my heart with gratitude and also gives me the strength to go on. Thank you. I survived. I'm sitting in front of gas chamber. The room. I want to send it. I'm sitting in front of gas chamber. The ruins of gas chamber number five. I'm sitting in front of gas chamber, the ruins of gas chamber number five, and I want to send a message, 
a smile and a hug for my great grandchildren. You are here with me right now. You will be growing up. You will hear about the story about the Holocaust. You will remember me and my wish for you that your life should be as complete as you wish to be and that you should be able to think back of this horror, terror, fear, danger. But your great grandma was in it. that you should never ever have to deal with and therefore even that that we, we fear terror lost I survived and I became a loving happy mother Grandma, great grandma, with wonderful friends around me. I wish for you that when you grow up, you should have all the happiness, all the joy of life. But I was able to get after that horrible loss. Of course, life is not that simple. And you know what I hope? That I will be able to tell you this personally, looking at you. I'm not ready to go anywhere yet. But just for sure, I want you to know that I love you all and wish you the nicest, happiest lives you can have. Okay. And why I'm crying now? Because I am an emotional great grandma. I can love, I can cry, I'm like a human being. Hold on. <laughs> share with you my memories, my feelings, my experiences, and what I learned in that most horrible time of my life. You know, people asking me kindly, but some people asking me why I am still talking about the Holocaust. It happened a long time ago. I know. I have a lot of, lot of reason to talk about it. I selected three reasons to share with you. The first one is that I hope that when I get to the end of my story, everybody will be willing and will see what prejudice, bigotry, and hate can do and does when it goes uncontrolled. In our case, the result was that many, many people got killed. The second reason came about two or three years ago 
that I started to hear and read in magazines, in newspaper, people saying the Holocaust didn't happen at all. I am a peaceful person, but when I heard that, I got angry, and I got angrier. I always say, I wish I could see one of those who are saying that. And I would ask a question. I would ask what you people are talking about. I am a witness. I've been there. I suffered there. All my family died. Nobody should tell me it didn't happen. I am a witness until I am alive. The third reason is very personal. You see, I don't know where are the ashes of my dear one in this huge, huge camp. I don't even have a grief to go to. So whenever I speak about them, and their, about their horrible fate. I feel I give my love to them and honoring them. And all of you here who are listening to me now, helping me to do this, and I thank you. Before I get to my story, in 1933, when Hitler came to power, I was a little girl, but I remember that my father was listening to the first speech of Hitler in Hungary. He listening on the radio. After he finished listening, he was telling us, I'm concerned, I'm afraid. The tone of voice of this man and what he is planning to do is dangerous. What will happen to us? And then we heard that in Germany already horrible things happened. And then in 1939, the Second World War broke out. And then we heard in Hungary that the German soldiers were occupying the small European countries almost weekly. They were getting closer and closer to us. In 1944, March 19, the SS troops marched into Hungary. And when this happened, we were afraid. Thousands of thousands of lot of soldiers. What will happen to us? We didn't have to wait too long. One week after they marched in, the so-called Jewish laws came to order. What was it? We have to wear the yellow star. We didn't have yellow star at home. Why should we? We had to march to the store with the Hungarian soldiers with us. We have to spend our own money and buy not only one, but more than one. Because whenever we stepped outside, we had to have the big yellow star on. It was right here above our heart. I have a necklace on. I don't know if you can see this as the Star of David. That was the shape of the yellow star, a huge out of material. And then, a week later, came the next order, the creation of the ghetto. We know what ghetto is, but let me explain that we lived in a big city, and the ghetto was a small location where they concentrated all the people they, the SS guards, wanted to see and watch 
every movement. Our house was in the borderline of the ghetto. When we looked out the window, we did see the road, the other side of the road, it was free. We became prisoners in our own home. A week later, eight more families were put in our small, normal family home. These poor people had to leave everything behind. They brought some things. We got crowded. The poor, they came in sad, lost and then the crowd. They had to sleep on the hallway. If they wanted to have one cup of water, they had to stand in line. If they needed to go to the bedroom and the bathroom, they had to stand in line. There was not enough room. There was no sleeping either. People were crying, screaming, wondering what will happen to us. Three weeks later came the next order. All men from 18 years old to 55 has to pack a package and next day line up in our own backyard and then they had to march to the forced labor camp. Later, if you ask questions, I can explain what was this. Now that my father was 48, he had to go. I remember he was packing his backpack and my mom was helping him. But as she was helping him, she was crying the whole time. And when my father left, with tears in his eyes, she couldn't stop crying. And I was the oldest one. I tried to calm her down, saying, maybe he comes back soon. She said, Noemi, I have a horrible feeling that I will never, ever see him again. I'm so sorry to share with you, she was right. They never met again. They were married for 25 years. A beautiful home, love, music, reading. And then he left. Who left back in this ghetto? Grandmas, grandpas young mothers with babies, and younger than I was then. In my family was my grandma, my mom. She was 43 and a half years old. When she was 43 years old, she had a baby. We had a six months old little baby brother. My little sister was 12 and a half, and I was 20, going to 21. Nobody talked to us, surrounded by the Hungarian soldiers. Food got less and less. For three horrible months, we had no idea what will happen to us. And then came the order. It said, you people here in the ghetto, have to pack a package and next morning line up in your own backyard. They even told us what to pack. One small pillow, one bed sheet, about this size of box, in it only dry food, no variables. We were told over and over again, don't you try to hide a ring. We will find it. And if we do, watch out. And the last one was, you may pack one 
change of underwear. Where are we going? What is it? Nobody to talk to. Surrounded by the guards, we were packing. Next day, we lined up in our own backyard. They searched us for valuables, and then we had to go through the whole city with the package with the big yellow star. I always say, I try to tell you what happened to me. Many, many things happened to many other people. What I am saying, I know. It happened to us. Why I am saying that? Because as we were marching through the city, people were standing on the two sides, on the street. Some people were waving, even crying. But most of them were yelling, good riddance, go. And we were walking. We got into the outskirts of the city. There was a factory. Nobody was there. Nobody worked there. Only people like us with the little packages, surrounded by the Hungarian soldiers. We were told to go up to the second floor. But no door, no steps, huh? They pointed out a tall ladder. We were told, climb. I was among the first one started to climb. When I got to the middle of that ladder, it occurred to me, where is my mom with the baby? Where is my grandma, my little sister? And I wanted to look back. When this happened, I heard somebody was running up on this ladder, and then I felt a horrible pain here in the middle of my back. A soldier ran after me, and he took out his bayonet. I always say, I hope you don't know what bayonet is. It's a long, silver-looking, very sharp edge tool of killing. He was pushing me and saying, you may not stop, you may not think, you may not do anything. Go, and other push. I almost fell over. Finally, he let me be, and I was thinking, what did I do? I just wanted to know, where is my family? Finally, I got up to the second floor. It was dirt floor. Slowly, slowly, everybody came. We settled down in a corner, but all facilities were downstairs. What was it? Cold water only. A little bit food, little, really little bit. And the bathroom. Whenever we needed any of those, we had to use that horrible ladder. We were there for 10 days. We felt miserable. We felt dirty, worn out, horrible. And then came the order. All of you, pack your package again, and in a half an hour, you have to be downstairs of the backyard of this factory. And you know, when the order came that we should go, we were jumping. We were ready. They didn't have to say it twice. Why? Because we were hoping that if we get away from here, maybe, maybe the next one will be a little bit better. Human beings should have hope. Sorry to share with you, in our case, Every next station 
got worse. Because when we got down to the backyard of this factory, the Hungarian soldiers gave us over the waiting German Nazi soldiers. And when this happened, in their eyes, we ceased to be human beings. We were a number only. Behind them was a long, long train made up of cattle cars. Here we call them box cars, but I looked the box cars here much, much larger than these cattle cars. We had to walk there. I spoke flu fluent German. I heard them counting. Eighty-five of us was pushed up in that very small cattle car. We hardly could stand. Then came the next order, sit down. It was almost impossible. I had my family sit down. I was still standing when came the next order. It said that all the packages should be in the middle of this cattle car. I took mine and my family's packages into the middle. It was semi-darkness, and I looked around where I am, where are we, what is that? What did I see? In each end, I did see an SS guard with the gun. In each end, two buckets, they were empty. I was a prisoner. I was not supposed to speak at all. Don't know what came over me. I asked one of the guards, what are those buckets for? To my surprise, he answered. He said, one of each will have water in it, and the other two for sanitary purposes for 80 five people. I don't have to explain what the sanitary purposes were. Let me tell you that it was end of June. They locked us in from outside. It was hot, no ventilation, and those buckets had no lid on them. I always say I never know that a smell has a memory. Whenever I speak about this and think about what happened, excuse me, I still smell that stench in that cattle car. It was horrible. We traveled eight days. The little babies were screaming. The school age children were asking, where are we going? Where is the food? Where is the bed? We didn't know. The old ones, among them my grandma, they had nightmares. They wanted to break out. They just couldn't believe it, that they can get out. But one day, my grandma was standing up during daytime and started to talk to us. Of course, in Hungarian, she was saying, I have it, it is mine, and nobody, but nobody can take it away from me. She repeated this about three times. She had nothing in her hand. I got so scared. She was always so sharp. What happened? I almost gave up when he bent down. She had a big skirt and a pocket on and slowly pulled out about this tall silver candle holder. And she was so proud, you see? I have it. 
and nobody but nobody can take it away from me. It was always so noisy in this cattle car, but everybody came so quiet. Remember they said not a ring. She is standing there with a candle holder. And she was so proud. What should I do? I gave her a big hug. I pried away her finger one by one. She didn't want to give it to me. Finally, I put it in my, my package. By this time, she was crying, sitting down. And I wanted to figure out why she brought this. I figured out why. You see, in our religion, we have a tradition that we light every Friday night the Shabbat candle for the next day, the Saturday. My dear grandma grew up in this tradition since she was a little bit girl. She heard the Nazis, no valuable. She disregarded it. She had to have her favorite silver candle holder. And I always say, I loved her always. But if it is possible, I loved her even more. She was a courageous dear grandma. She disregarded what the Nazis said. As I said, we traveled eight days. Many things happened. Finally, the cattle car stopped. There was a little window I looked out. There was a train station there with two names on it. I still, I never spoke Polish. And that looked like Auschwitzin. But the other one said Auschwitz. And believe me, we had no idea what Auschwitz meant. We were happy that finally they opened the door, a little air came in, and then we were told, all of you out, and leave that little package behind. You may not bring anything with you. We got out, we lined up in pairs. I was with my mom, who had the baby. Behind me, my grandma and my little sister. It was a long, long, long line. Everybody was tired. And then all of a sudden I noticed that the top of the line is separating for some reason. We didn't know why until we got on the top. And then ever I get to this part of my story, uh, this is not memory anymore. If I close my eye or I open, I see ourselves standing there. What did I see? There was an SS officer in his uniform. He had white gloves on his hand and in one hand a horse whip. And he looked us, all of us, five of us, and then slowly he raised his arm. And with one signal, he sent my mom with the baby, my grandma, and my sister to his left. He was facing us. Then he looked at me again. I got to the other side. I remember we were separated. We couldn't talk to each other anymore. But I remember I turned around and I looked at my mom, who had the baby and was leaning toward me. And I did see her beautiful, beautiful eyes, and her eyes were speaking to me. 
her eyes toward to me, Noemi, take care of yourself. I love you. I'm really very sorry to share with you. This was the very last time I saw them. Never ever again. On my side, we were pushed in in a barrack. We were told that we have to undress. We had to leave everything in this barrack. We had to keep our pair of shoes in an other barrack. Here we were told we will be shaved. We think they were shaving our head. They were not cutting our hair. They shaved our hair. My head looked like my palm. But they also shaved all body parts. And we were young girls, and we were scared to death. And then an other back shower. We looked at the ceiling, we did see the shower head, but nothing to open the shower with. I remember we could not speak. As we looked at each other, we thought maybe this is the end. But we were lucky. They opened up the shower from outside. Water came. But here we standing, wet all over, no towel, no dress, just a pair of shoes. Next to us, a line of SS women guard. And they had old dresses in their arm, dresses for women who were already dead in Auschwitz. And they told us to march. And as we were marching, they were throwing the dresses in the air. We had to catch it. And disregarding the size, what we got or what we had, we had to wear it. Slowly, slowly, we learned what Auschwitz meant. Finally, they led us out to the campground. Here we did see thousands of thousands of people, and we did see a lot of, lot of German shepherd dogs. They were trained as we were marching, and we stepped out just a little bit from the line. The dogs were jumping and holding us. Finally, we got to a front of a barrack. Every ten barracks is a watchtower. The gun, the guard with the gun. We were told that every single barrack has six rooms in it. And every, each room, hundreds of us was pushed in. It was narrow and small and dirt floor. We were told that's where we sleep. Early morning, rain or shine, late at night, outside. This barracks had no bathrooms. If somebody had to go out at night, had to go out to the latrine. But what happened was that we were so close to each other and it was dark. We didn't see where we were stepping. We stepped on each other. It was a lot of crying and screaming. Early morning, we had to line up and we were told we get breakfast. Well, it was about time. And we were young and we were hungry. What was the breakfast? One cup of coffee so called and one slice of bread. Nothing more. What was the dinner? The same. We were always hungry. 
we couldn't wait for that second slice of bread coming, although we learned while we were eating it that the half of the ingredients of that bread was sawdust. I'm not telling you fairy tales. It is doc documented. That's what they fed us with. And then came lunch. What is lunch? Soup. Oh, fine, finally. Waiting for the bowl never came. The first one at the very top of the line got a big bowl. They poured the soup in. She had to drink out of it and give it over and over and over and over to the next. That soup smelled horrible. And when it got to the group I was in, we said, although we were hungry, we said, please pass it. We don't want it. Not because it smelled bad, but because we were too close to home to bring ourselves to drink after so many leaps and months. As soon as we said that, the God was there. I heard that you people said no. You have to learn that you have no right to say no. You do what we tell you to do, and you don't do it. It will be something you will see. It will something else happen. We were there long enough to learn that when the Nazis say that you do this, if you don't, or else meant we kill you. We didn't want to die. We were young, and we started to drink that thing next day. But something else happened. The group I was in, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, were all young women. What young women have every month? Menstruation, period. The Nazis were not willing to work with that either. And now I'm getting very personal. When I stepped down from that cattle car and I had to leave everything behind, I got mine. I had to march. They separated me from my dear ones. I had to undress. I was shaved. I had to shower. And I had it. I always say I never, ever remember feeling so lonely, so lost. Whom should I ask? The SS guards? No. And the first day, I didn't drink about the soup. The next day, because or else, I started to drink in every one of us. And what happened? Within an hour, the menstruation stopped. We were there for four months, never came. Why? We learned that it, this soup was a newly found medicine which stopped the menstruation. And that is the reason and what happened was horrible. Again, I'm speaking of what I know. Many, many other people have will happen that. But I know three of my friends who were liberated, who got home, got married, wanted to have kids. They couldn't have any. They were so destroyed with that medicine. It's horrible. It's tragedy, it's horror. But when I get to this part, 
I have to just think about a little bit further. And then I start to maybe smile. Why? Because I got liberated. You will, you will hear how I got home. I got married. I have two sons, five grandchildren, and as of August 31st, six great grand babies. And that, <laughs> thank you. I feel a winner, victory, because Hitler is dead, isn't he? I am alive, and my beautiful new family is growing. And I am so proud of them. And I feel that life is really wonderful. Because, by the way, all the great grandbabies are all girls. <laughs> Don't know what happened. <laughs> but nothing wrong with the boys either. <laughs> but I love them. And you see, when I think about it, I feel that we have to have the strength, really, to be happy about things, what is coming toward us. Back to Auschwitz again. We didn't have water. Nothing to wash ourselves, nothing to drink. Sometimes we used the coffee. We washed our face with coffee, just to feel a kind of wetness. Once in a while, they brought in water in a tank. They poured in a basin. They gave us a little cup, and they told us, drink. We get there, and we try to have a little water. When we try to spill it, it spilled out from the movement. And we heard the guards talking. What they were saying, look at them. They are not human beings, not even animals. They are little worms. They kill each other for water. Number one, we didn't kill each other. We just tried to get some water. But to hear day in and day out that we are not human beings, it was horrible. Next time they brought in water, many of us stepped back. We didn't want to hear that we are not human beings. And they didn't mind we will die earlier, faster. But when I speak about it, that four months, I did not have one drop of water in me. I am getting thirsty, and my dear friends know that. Look what is here. I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> Did you see that? It's water. I have to drink. Oh, tastes good. <laughs> I have to put them away because I will be drinking that water for a while. But you see, people are telling me that I am advertising water. <laughs> well, it may be. Whenever I go anywhere, they're asking me, what do you want to drink? I said, don't worry, one glass of clean, cold water is the best. And then, if I advertising it, nothing wrong with it, it's good for you. So, have try some water, it's good. Back to Auschwitz again. We had nothing to do that, nothing at all. We had only one thing to do, to die. 
we were dying. We lost weight between 58 and 62 pounds, and we were grown-ups. And every so-called breakfast and every so-called dinner, we had to line up, and for three hours, we had to be counted. We could not have ex escaped. The fences were electrified, German shepherd dogs, guards, but people were losing weight, got sick, they fell. They were still alive. They were picked up, thrown on a truck, they were driven away. We never ever saw them again. One day, I got unconscious. Not that I gave up. I was very sick then. And I lost consciousness and started to fall. But how come I didn't get on this truck? How come that I'm still alive? Because in that terrible, horrible place, Auschwitz-Birkenau, I had some treasures. What could it be? I had friends. I was told that three of my friends, one on the right, one on the left, and one behind me, when they saw me falling, in a second they decided that they risked their own life and saved mine. They took turns and they were holding me with that one leg. They were telling me that I was wanting to go. It was hard to keep me straight, but they made it for three hours. Then finally we sat down. I woke up and I asked, what happened? They told me and I learned and this, in this place, Auschwitz-Birkenau, where everybody was killed, where humanity was gone, I had three wonderful friends. They risked their life to save mine. When I first went back to Hungary, the first time from here, from the United States, I met one of them. And she asked me, do you remember what happened to you in Auschwitz? I said, of course I remember. I'm alive because of you people. We ran to each other. We were hugging, kissing, and celebrating. And celebrating what? Celebrating life. I am not taking for granted that I am alive. I learned in Auschwitz how precious to be alive. And by talking to each other with this dear person, we realized that the only and most important thing is to be alive. Nobody has to go to Auschwitz, Birkenau, to have problems. I know everybody has problems. The question is how we deal with it. And I decided, getting to that horror, that I will be thankful and I will be happy to be alive. And I know that life is not so easy. But I learned in Auschwitz that if you are alive, this is the gift what you have to deal with. And that's what I'm trying to do. And it makes sense to me. Don't think, though, that I wake up every morning and say, what well, I will be happy today. What, what should I be happy today about? No, 
I can be angry, and I'm getting angrier for certain things, and then I say, okay, solve the problem, go on living. And this is my policy. That's how I am, not only alive, but I am, for some reason, healthy, and I, with that silver hair, I am not 28, 58, 68, more, more eight, but, but I am still okay. And maybe because I love life, and I am not embarrassed to say it. I have to get back to Auschwitz one more. We didn't know what happened to our dear ones. And so we tried to ask the guards, but it was so hard to speak. We took turns. Nobody answered. We asked, where are they? Finally, a woman guard came. She stopped, and she was yelling. You really want to know what happened to them? Yes, ma'am. She said, you see that gray cloud over there? We said, yes, we do see on the sky, and we are choking on something. What is it? But yes, we do see it. Then she asked, do you smell that horrible smell? Yes, ma'am, we do. In Auschwitz, they had a lot of chimneys. She pointed on one. She said, do you see the fire day and night on that chimney? Do you? Yes, ma'am. But where are they? And then she said, look at that cloud. Look at the fire. And then she said, here are your relatives. You see, here they go all the way to the fire. We thought we must be really sick, that maybe we don't understand what she is talking about. And then we learned that she told us the truth. Then we got separated. They went in an other barrack. They had to undress. Then they went into the shaving too. But when they got into the so-called, that was shower room for us. For them was a gas chamber. And that's where they were pushed in, hundred and hundred of them, and instead water, gas bulbs were thrown in, they exploded, and there were all the dear ones suffocated. Among them, my grandma, my mom, my little sister, my little brother, and many, many aunt and uncle and cousins. When they didn't move anymore, we were told they were put in a carrier, they were thrown in a crematorium, and they were burned. And that's why it's still in that Auschwitz a lot of, lot of ashes everywhere. I was there three more weeks, smelling that, knowing that. And then the man who separated us at the beginning came again. This officer's name was Dr. Joseph Mengele, the infamous man who daily sent thousands and thousands of people to death. He was there again. Why? We had to line up, and we were selected, thousands of us, in a corner. And we were told that he got a request from Germany. They needed thousand Hungarian girls 
who's still alive and moving, to have them in their war effort. We got prisoner outfit onto the cattle car and from Poland to Europe to Germany into an other camp. That was Buchenwald, a huge camp, into a sub camp. And here we were surprised. We had bomb bats. We were able to take shower. And for 10 days, we didn't work. And then, in that 10 days, we got a little bit more food, but not a lot. When the 10 days were over, they selected us out. 25 of us were sent to work, and many others went to the big factory to work. And we had to march four miles to work. It was winter, no jacket, no socks, wooden shoes. We found there an engineer, a foreman, a lot of, lot of guards. And we were told that we are there to make bombs. Us, little skeletons, bombs? Yes. They showed us huge, tall, very long tables on a trace. And on the trace, this size of bars, different colors and wires. And we were told that we have to work on this very carefully because these balls are poisonous chemicals. If we drop one of them, it will blow up. Everybody will die. For one second, we thought, maybe we kick it over, all the Nazis die. Good idea. Uh-uh, no. We don't want to die. We had to do something else. We learned what, what to do. And then we learned what to do. We learned also that whatever we made, it was sent to the factory, was put together a certain way, put in the plane, it was sent away to do what? To kill. Kill whom? Those we praying to liberate us. The, who are they? The Americans and the Allies. What should we do? We are slave workers. We are prisoners. The next room are the guards with the gun. What should we do? We had something else, but they didn't have. We spoke Hungarian, and we said to each other, you know what, let's make a little sabotage. Well, good idea. How you do it? We had fun. You know, we color-coded. And I did this with these hands, no glove. No mask, nothing. And we did fun. We made such a mess. The green got the red, the red wire. The black got the white wire. No matching color here. We made such a mess. And we were giggling, laughing. Finally, we do something against that horrible power. And then something happened. In the next room, those SS guards heard us laughing. And I always say, excuse me, those dumb Nazis in the other room, when they heard us laughing, they thought that we are having a fun working for them. And they didn't come in very often to check on us. 
so when they came in, we made a matching color, art it went, we were laughing and making the mess. We didn't do, do no, no, if we did a good job. And I was already here in Bellingham. I spoke in the Central Library, and the man, older man, was sitting in the first row. And then I got to this part that we didn't know if we did a good job. He said, but I do. I said, sir, what do you know? He said, I was in Germany for six months. We were pushing, pulling for Berlin. Hitler was still alive. And the Nazis were bombing us day and night. But to our surprise, some of the bombs came fell down, did not explode them. <laughs> over there, over there, many of them not exploded. I said, I hope one of them was mine, <laughs> but we were 25 of us. And now we learned people calling, called us veterans because maybe we saved Americans. We worked seven months, and finally we made a mess as much as we could. They opened the gates out. We rested down in a forest, and all the SS, everybody came with us. When we left that forest, we had a surprise. All SS officers, guards, were in civilian clothes. What happened to the uniform? They left it in the forest. That gave us an idea. They might, must know that the Allies come in closer. So we got to the highway. They want us to make that march from here, the other end of Germany. And then, as we were marching, more and more, 12 of us, I don't know how we got the courage, we did see a thick forest, and one by one, slowly, we disappeared. We were waiting in a forest. All of a sudden, we heard steps. A soldier was coming. Uh -uh. They discovered us. But the soldier was not a German soldier. The soldier was an American soldier. He asked, How, who speaks English? Mm -mm. Hungarian and German. He spoke very well German. He was from Patton's army. He said, you will hear gunshot. You will see fire. Don't be afraid. I have to leave now, but I will come back. Next day, that dear man came back. I will never, ever forget his face. I will never forget his voice. And I definitely will never forget what he said. He said, you are all free. This part of Germany surrendered. Here we are, 12 little skeleton girls, and we jumped him, <laughs> all of us, 12 of us. We kissed him, hugged him. We didn't want to let him go. He said, don't suffocate me, you still need me. He took us to the headquarters. They took our names and then into a barrack, and this barrack had real food in it. We wanted to eat everything. The American doctor came, slow down. Your digestive system it doesn't know what to do with the food. You can die when you are free. It was hard, but we made it. This was in April. In September, I was back in Hungary, and here I learned that my father survived. We met, 
I had to tell him what happened to his dear ones. What I told you at the beginning, we were crying, grieving, but then we discovered and was thinking my mom would not like that. Get out to life. He was a teacher and principal, went back to school. I got married, I had two sons, and then I went to college, I became a teacher. I was still in Germany, May the 8th, 1945, when the peace broke out in Europe. The war was not over. Here I have to stop because we're getting out of time, only I have to make two comments. Many people asking me if I have hate in me, and I say a big no. Why? Because I learned in Auschwitz, hate is killing everyone. Prejudice, bigotry, hate is wrong. If I would have hate in my heart now, I would not be free. I would be the prisoner of my own hate. That is not working with me anymore. I am a free woman who has learned that bigotry, prejudice, and hate is wrong. We have to find a way. And I am doing what? What I can do is that almost every single day telling people what is Auschwitz Birkenau, what is hate, and what is killing each other means. Here I have to really stop, only I have to tell you. And thank you that you were listening. As you see, I don't have notes. Everything is up here and in my heart. And this makes me able to look. And I did see a lot of you, the eyes of you. You were with me. You were with me and you were sorry and you were happy with me. I thank you so much. Thanks. Or keep it and why? Do you have a number tattoo, and why or why not? Yeah, I don't have a tattoo, and why not? Because we arrived to Auschwitz in 1944, July the 1st. Then we didn't know, but now I know, that the Normandy invasion was in June 1944, and the whole war started to change. The Nazis started to lose, and the Allies started to win. What happened in Auschwitz, I was there then, they tripled and doubled up the killing because they felt that they are losing. And we did see other people and we said they ran out of ink. What they were doing, they had yellow paint and we didn't have hair. On the top of the head, all the way down, a yellow stripe and burned on us, but we didn't have number. But I know my number because when they took us from Auschwitz to Buchenwald to make the bomb, in the cattle car with the guards was a paper. And I was always kind of nosy, and I was looking what is on it. I did see my name 
and next to my name was it numbered. And I memorized it. 23,900. That's what's happening here. But you know what? I'm not complaining. I'm really happy with that. That I know my number. Thank you. This uh, next question is from the live stream. Thank you in the audience streaming by internet through our alumni association. The question is, in the video we saw that you've had the strength to return to those death camps. How did you have such strength to go back? It's, it's a very reasonable question. But you see what happened was, first of all, I have to tell you that when I first went back to Auschwitz-Birkenau, who came with me? Dr. Walter. He was the one I was there seven times. But the first time I went with him. Why I went back? because that was the place where last I did see my mom, my grandma, my sister and brother. And I just had to go back to see that place as a free woman. When I first left Auschwitz, I went to another camp, Germany, made the bomb. That was the first time when I came as a free woman. And this is the time when we find what was the gas chamber where my dear ones were killed. When the Nazis grasped the war, they dynamited all the gas chambers. And we did see five of them in one room. And when one, two, three, four, which one? Finally, on the fifth one, I just get in, I, I touch every brick, every wire. But he had a hard job to get up, me from there. And then, when we stepped a few steps, there was a sign. Gas chamber number five was the one that those Hungarians who arrived in 1944, July the 1st, were killed. And that's that my dear ones were killed. And whenever I go back, that's the first place I go. I almost forgetting what I suffered there because in my mind, was the most horrible thing. And, and why I'm going back? Because that's how I give my love for them. That's how I honoring them. That's how I remembering them. And that is the place when I very last saw them alive. That's why. Thank you. I'm remembering that day, too. Mm -hmm. I remember that day as yeah, well. Sure. We got to say the ancient Hebrew prayer Kaddish for a family and have a little bit of a sense of completion that day. <sighs> Noemi, you talk about your three friends that helped save your life. Yeah. Do you remember their names? and? Have you kept in touch with any of them? Of what? The three friends. Do you yeah. remember their names? And have you kept in touch with any of them? Oh, yeah. Well, whenever I went back to Auschwitz, I went back to Hungary. And the out of the three, the two of them lived in another city. But we kept in touch. But then, I heard that one of them died, had kidney problem, 
the other heart problem because of Auschwitz. The third one, every single time I went back, we met, except this September. I learned that she passed away, she had cancer. But I still have people there who were in Auschwitz, not exactly where I am. And she is telling me that every they live in Budapest, which is the capital of Hungary, and they every single month they meet and have lunch and talking about their memories. And I ask, what are you talking about? She, they, she said, we're talking about many, many things, and then we talk about you. I said, what are you talking about me? We are jealous. You are the only one who is in America. I said, keep on jealous. That's OK with me. So I'm going to combine two questions for you. Yeah. One question was, what made you want to live in the midst of such horror and death? Yeah. What made you want to live while you were in the yeah. camps? And a related question to that is, at the age you are now, are you a <laughs> young thing that you are? <laughs> at the age you are now, are you afraid of death? At your current age, are you afraid of death? Afraid? Yes. Of what? Of death. Oh, no. OK. <laughs> but <laughs> so what makes me live in, in our suite? I was thinking a lot when I got free. What made me be, be alive? And I usually don't talk about it, but when we get to this, I ask these three girls, why on earth you did that to keep him up? You could have been killed. They were saying, because you were good to us. I said, what did I do? That I had my shoulder when they wanted to cry. They, they, I was there to listen to them. I was there to tell them stories when they asked. So I made them alive. And I don't know why I never, ever thought about it, that I will die. I have to live. But this was not so clear then thinking back, but it must have been. And then again, when Mangala separated us to take us to Germany, I was thinking we were all characters. We I thought that we look all the same. And then thinking back, Mangala was a physician before he became a killer, and he knew body language. And it could have been that those of us he selected to be able to work, not to live, to work, we must have had some body language. Maybe we had our head up, maybe a look, maybe the shoulder, something said to him that these people are strong enough to work. And that means that that kept me alive. It looks like that I was sure, and I didn't even think about it, dying. No, no, I am not afraid of death at all. With other words, I don't even think about that. It is not in my schedule yet. <laughs> not at all. 
I just keep on living and you see what happened. I was in this horror and dying and I survived. And you have to believe me when I say it because true, I don't have any medicine at home. I have vitamins and tums. <laughs> That's it. So if I am that healthy, I feel I have a, a, something I have to do. I have the feeling that just because I survived and then even now I'm so healthy, that is something telling me keep on going. And this gives me strength, and this gives me again to, to think about life and not death. But I know that nobody lives forever. They told me that. And what I think that when I speak, I am doing something for especially this generation. Because when I'm speaking in college or high school, I know that when these people will have families, I won't be wrong. And I feel that I have the duty almost to tell what happened. Because those people who were alive during the Holocaust, dying out. And that's why I keep my time telling, sharing, and this makes me also healthy, I guess so. I'm careful, though. When I come down on the steps, I ask for help, because a broken knee or an ankle, uh -uh. Not for me. <laughs> we have so many wonderful questions, and we won't get to them all, but we will have Noemi answer those and transcribe them and post them to our website. But here's the last pair of questions, two questions together. Yeah. <clears throat> we know you're an award-winning teacher. First part of the question, what is your most important advice for a new teacher? That's the first part. Okay. And the second part is, what would you say to future generations, 20 or 30 years from now, if you could, about Holocaust, genocide, ethnocide? What would you say 20 years from now? And what for that new teacher, what would you say there? First of all, you said what I would say, a teacher, no. how much time we have. <laughs> but, Just a couple of minutes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> OK. Now, um, I had a wonderful experience in that show. I was in California now for a week. And there, my granddaughter is first year teaching. And I was in the classroom and watched her teach. And this was the most wonderful. I was in the seventh heaven, uh, sitting and listening to her. But then again, also they asked me to speak with the fourth and fifth grade kids. This is too early, especially the fourth grade. And because I was a teacher, and some people say I still am, I felt that a teacher duty is to feel those kids, what they, not what they want to hear, but to feel that they are human beings, little one, old one, and we have to see in them 
the wanting to learn, wanting to learn about life, and by teaching, giving them the gift of knowledge, and watching very carefully that that to believe that they are little human beings with problems. These are human beings who need love, understanding, and they need from us to share the knowledge what we have. And then, if someone, I also did that, when something came up, and they asked me what it's all about. And I said, you know what? I don't know. Let's get the book. Let's get sit down. Let's study together to show that we are also human beings, not somebody high up. And this is for two minutes, three minutes, four? <laughs> OK. Well, the only wish and the only hope is that, number one, 20 years from now, and we'll be, and this is a wish, and I don't know it could happen, that it won't be necessary to be work and talk about the thing is happening there, about the Holocaust, I would use as long as is necessary to teach people that the Holocaust and all the what goes with it is necessary to learn about because it gives us a chance, a tool, to take care of the one which is happening now. Because right now, I am not so naive that thing that everything is absolutely fine because Holocaust is over. I know that a lot of, lot of anti-Semites are, that there are people who are suffering, are poor, and everywhere of different kind of Holocaust. And if we, we cannot save the whole world, but if we think and know that there is a need for us to act, and not only about the Holocaust, anything what happens, which we think is wrong, to take part. And I hope that the Holocaust, as a study, will help people then to act on the problem what they have them. That's what I think. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, those of you that have streamed in, thanks to the Alumni Association. It's been a pleasure having you in our audience and all of you who were present. Really powerful, good energy in the room, and we thank you for that. In a moment, we'll set Noemi up on stage here for book signing, and people can line up on that side if they will, if those who wish to have books signed. And thank you all <coughs> for coming, and hope to see some of you on April 27th at the Living Tribute to Noemi Bach. Thank you. <laughs>